Um, okay, so we're, we're uh, going to finish up linear fu uh, function approximation today. Uh, probably move on to policy gradient. So we're doing value-based methods. And this is just a reminder. Um, you already had learned Q-learning, and the only thing we really had to change uh, for the basic uh, approach was the update looks like this now. And instead, previously, we were just updating specific tables. So this Q function would just be a table, and uh, we would update only the values for that particular state action pair. Um, that, was, that was exhibited, but now we're updating the parameter values. And this has the influence of uh, changing not just you know, the values for the state action pair we saw, but also you know, other values as well, which, which are hard to predict. Um, how they change and, and uh, which ones will change. Uh, but uh, this was the only change, this, this line, and we sort of showed how that was derived. Um, there weren't great theoretical uh, guarantees for these uh, function approximation methods for value functions, even, even if you're in the linear case. So we went through some examples of how Q-learning can diverge. And Sarsa, you know, the guarantees are pretty weak. And we saw this example of uh, Q-learning, these battles. So this is, this is a, an example that showed you how you might define features for a particular problem. Uh, and uh, we saw that pretty simple linear function approximation worked well on this problem. Um, so that's where we were. And now, uh, you know, the, the thing here is, when you can use linear function approximation, when you have a handful of features that seem good, you might as well try it. Like, it's a, the starting point you should always try. So in robotics, you know, just try giving the joint angles, it, you know, give the state of the robot and try to do a linear function, function approximator um, on top of uh, those values uh, before you use a deep network. So that, that's something you should always try. You should always use that as a baseline. When you're, when you're doing these things, because either it's going to be uh, surprisingly good, and that's just a more stable, uh, easier to train uh, mechanism, a linear function approximator, or, or you're going to find that you do significantly better, and it's nice to know that the, the nonlinear stuff is paying off. Um, or you might find the nonlinear stuff does significantly worse, and then you know, something screwed up. So any of those things could happen with you know, equal probability, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but, uh, you know, when, when you're not able to get a good performance with a linear function approximator, uh, you know, one thing to do is to create more features. So I told you uh, with the example we saw on that Worgis problem, it's always an iterative process. So you define some features, you see the performance, uh, they're not doing well, you see the behavior, and you try to guess what it is they might be missing in terms of information. And, in that example, one of the pieces of information was uh, the agents, you know, in our first set of features didn't know who they were currently attacking. And they had no memory. And, and then it was pretty clear watching the videos that you'd have agents, you know, going back and forth because they didn't know who they were attacking. But so we added a feature that said who they're attacking. Um, that's, that's one example. But uh, sometimes that, that won't work and sometimes it's hopeless. Uh, so... You know, the, the extreme example is if uh, the original input are just pixels, right? Generally, you don't want to do a linear function approximator over pixel level inputs. It's not going to work very well unless it's a very, very trivial problem. Um, and so, uh, so there, that, that's, where, that's a place where you probably need to do some sort of nonlinear function approximation. And in particular, using something that's really designed for, for images in that case. Um, so neural networks would probably be appropriate at that point. So we're gonna we're gonna go over um, how you uh, do nonlinear versions of what we've seen. Um, pretty straightforward changes, uh, and then we're gonna look at some of the practical steps that are used for an algorithm called DQN, uh, which uh, yeah we'll, we'll talk about the significance of that. And that's actually gonna be the basis for your your next. Um, assignment after after your current key learning assignment. So you'll be hopefully training something for, for an Atari game where we, we're going to try that. Um, a simpler Atari game, but we, we think that might be doable. We're, we're working on that right now. 
Um, so nonlinear function approximation, let's just remember um, the gradient descent stuff. So we said if an oracle gave you states and values for those states, um, you, you know, they might be produced by a TD loop. Uh, we said that mean squared error, right, this is a, the mean squared, the error for a particular uh, example, we'd like to minimize this um, for, and, you know, we, we want to minimize the mean of this over all the instances, but um, often you'll just do one gradient step uh, in the direction of this single example. And yeah, we, we went over this before, so you can take a gradient of that and take a step and you'll hopefully reduce your error. And this is the key thing. Um, so we said that to compute the gradient, we had this chain rule. Uh, this part here doesn't depend on the function approximator, the, the architecture of it. It's just this is the value that you return and uh, from the function approximator. And how does that value influence the, uh, the uh, error term? And so you'll always get this. But this is the part that depends on the form of the function approximator. Right? So these are the parameters of the function approximator. And this is asking, well, if I change theta i, how does the value of the function approximator change? Does it go up or down? And by, by how much, roughly? Um, so that's what this term is. And we have to take, uh, you know, for a linear function, we saw that was just equal to the feature value or feature i, uh, which makes sense. It's kind of the slope. Um, and uh, now it could be a nonlinear, you know, a nonlinear function. We'll have to have a way of doing this. But uh, we're going to we're going to describe. So, so this is sort of a general thing. And you have to derive this uh, for each approximator you might use. But we're going to talk about how to do this with a neural net, like a modern neural net library that makes it relatively easy because uh, modern libraries sort of do all the differentiation for you. Um, you know, it used to be in papers, uh, you would define some complex thing, some, some complex function, and you'd spend time actually computing the gradient and, you know, by hand, you, and you, you might even have a theorem that says the gradient's this and it simplifies to this, and then you'd implement it by hand. Nowadays, you just define a loss function in, in most cases, and it just automatically differentiates, so it's a lot easier um, than it used to be, and you can uh, really develop things very quickly. So, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about what that looks like. Um, but uh, you know, this is this is one slide that says if you were just doing a straightforward adaptation of what we've learned to uh, nonlinear function approximation, this is all that changes. Um, this used to be f of S A. Um, fi of SA, the, the I feature value for the SA pair, um, but uh, now it's going to be something else, uh, you know, depending on the approximator. So that's pretty straightforward, right? You, you all, uh, all should understand this because um, it, it follows directly from what we've already done. Uh, you could get a version of SARSA if you wanted to by replacing the max with just a uh, a prime is the action that's taken in the next state by the policy. Um, so that's, that's fairly uh, straightforward. Any questions about this? All right. So, and this is basically what we used for that demonstration that I showed you with the, uh, the you know, army units attacking one another. We, we basically use this algorithm. Uh, and yeah, that was, it was pretty straightforward. Um, but uh, you're, you're not generally going to do that explicitly uh, nowadays with, with these modern libraries. And so, so PyTorch and TensorFlow are good examples of modern machine learning libraries with inbuilt auto differentiation. Um, and they also have inbuilt uh, optimizers. So, so, so generally you don't have to, uh, you have to pick an optimizer, but once you do that, the optimizer will be adjusting the learning rate. And there's all kinds of these optimizers, and they all have different slight variants of, you know, how they change the learning rate. Um, you know, Atom is one uh, famous one. Uh, they, they also have just vanilla stochastic gradient descent. Uh, these optimizers have their own parameters, so, so it's always a little bit of a, you know, you have to play around with these, and, and people come up with their favorite ones, and... Uh, but 
there's no real science behind picking those. Uh, usually the optimizers are heuristically motivated. There's some theory behind it, but usually you know, at the end of the day, there's some heuristics with parameters. Um, but more or less what they do with the learning rate is when you're, when you're not, when, when, when things are moving slowly, they'll boost up the learning rate. And when things are uh, moving too fast, they'll scale it down. You know, that's roughly what they do. And there are lots of ways of doing that. So, uh, so you'll have optimizers at your hand if you want. Um, and, and generally what you're going to do is, you know, if you're using a neural net, and, and you can use these packages for linear function approximation too. That's just a degenerate neural network. Um, if you don't know about neural nets, it's okay. Uh, but just imagine just a really large function with lots of parameters um, for now. Uh, when, when it gets into the assignment where you're going to use neural nets, we'll have a little bit of background, but we'll give you the, the, the tools you need to just call them almost as a black box. So you define your structure of the neural net, and, and they'll have some parameters. Uh, in a neural net, these are the weights. Um, we'll see, see an example in a moment. Then you define a loss function, and we said that our loss function is going to be the mean squared error, right? That's the... You know, how much do we, uh, how much loss do we uh, associate with our prediction being incorrect? And we're going to use mean squared error usually. Um, then you select your optimizer and the optimizer parameters. They all usually have at least one parameter. And then we're going to feed examples from the RL loop into this uh, optimizer. And so we need to say what those examples look like. Um, and so, so that's a little bit different than what we just showed. Here, you're literally computing the gradient yourself and doing the optimization, doing, doing the update. Uh, what I said here is we're just going to feed examples uh, to the optimizer, and it's going to do the update of the gradient. So here's what that looks like. Um, so we're going to, uh, as we said, define the network, define your loss function, uh, initialize the optimizer, then you're just going to enter into a loop. Um, so every episode, you're going to uh, run an explore exploit policy, and that the exploit part's based on your current uh, Q function. Then you're going to take the action. You're going to see the reward in the next state. And then this is what we mean by send an example to the optimizer. So you're going to create this little package that has the state in the action, Right? And, and there are different ways of doing this, but you know, abstractly, you're, you're creating a package that has a state in the action. That's sort of the input, right? That's the input uh, that we want evaluated. We want the Q value of that. And then we're giving a target value that we want the Q function we're learning uh, to sort of move towards, right? And this is the traditional target value that we've been using for Q learning. Um, so think of this as a, an input-output pair that... We're saying, hey, optimizer, try to make our current function more consistent with this example. And uh, that's you know, more or less it. Then you just keep going around this loop. So the only difference is uh, you don't have to think about the gradients or anything like that, any learning rates. You just send these examples to the optimizer one after another, and, and it will uh, ideally uh, do the right thing, and you'll converge and have a good Q function. So... So it's actually, uh, you know, quite quite a bit easier than it used to be, because um, this thing here, this Q function, could be a gigantic neural network. You just use a few lines of code to define it, and then everything else is done for you. So, so yeah, you're living in a different age. Um, uh, and now, now I'm going to tell you about something from the '90s uh, that that involved value function based uh, function approximation. Uh, and th this is the problem that people in reinforcement learning uh, bragged about for years and years before some of the more recent things uh, that especially DeepMind has been doing with reinforcement learning. Um, so, but, but literally, this is, this is one of the main successes for, for years and years and years that you'd always point to. So what can RL do? It can solve back in it. Um, so, so this was uh, by Gerald Cesaro at uh, IBM. He's, he's still around and active. He, he does some interesting things. And uh, so backgammon uh, was, 
Oh, how many people have ever seen backgammon or played backgammon? Um, I'll play before. I haven't. I don't know if I could remember the rules now, but well, it's a dice game with lots of randomness. Like you roll two dice per turn, I think. Um, and so there's a lot of randomness involved. But good players, um, it's a big difference between good and bad players. Um, and uh, yeah, so so while it's random, you, if you play enough games, you'll you'll definitely see who's a better player. Um, without without playing too many games, even it's not as random as poker. Um, so so this was uh, an example of where uh, the you know, the best uh, backgammon programs of the time were not near world championship level, and Gerald Cesaro. Uh, showed that you could just use vanilla reinforcement learning with a neural network to get a world championship level player. And so we'll talk a little bit about how, how he did that. Um, so I said a neural network. Uh, yes. Just out of curiosity, how did that compare to a uh, computer system based on alpha beta uh, searches? Alpha beta is going to be so so here. There's stochasticity, so you'd be using a, you wouldn't be doing a mini max tree. You'd be doing a mini expecting max tree, yeah, mini expecting max tree. Um, and so uh, so the stochastic branching just kind of kill. I mean, you, you can't get very far. Um, but you know, I, I don't know. So what I do know is that he did improve performance at the end by using a small amount of search using his learned value functions. Um, so, so uh, yeah, but presumably this, this was doing a lot better because that's, that's what, what we heard about. So, so this is a neural net, uh, and uh, he used TD reinforcement learning. And remember, TD just learns the value function, right? And we've said many times, if you just have a value function, you can't select an action. But, uh, but here we have the rules of the game for backgammon, right? So we can, we have the model, the exact model, and that's how, uh, that's how you can get by with just learning a value function. Um, so you don't have to learn the model. There's no reason to do that. So you can do your one-step look ahead pretty easily. Um, and most likely he was using sampling for that because, uh, yeah, the, uh, you know, if you take an action in backgammon, there's a lot of different die roll possibilities and, and you have to oh well, actually no so yeah they would roll the die and then you'd see your die and then you'd make your action yeah so you wouldn't have to do that um, so that's one thing and, and with the modern alpha go alpha zero is the same thing they have the model and, and they well they learn both policy and value function but we will be talking about that later because they do more than just reinforcement learning so we got to wait till later in the class so the neural network back then, uh, often back then, the way that you would characterize the size of a neural network was the size of the hidden layer, the number of units in the hidden layer, um, which seems pretty, I mean, it's pretty funny nowadays because back then, so a hidden layer, right? Not just, uh, just one, because it was pretty crazy to even think about, you know, training over many hidden layers. Like it didn't seem like that was something that you could do feasibly. Um, so you would characterize it by 80 hidden units. Nowadays, you know, the, the depth is, you know, much, much larger in most cases. Although these hidden units were fully connected. So fully connected layers, even today, I don't think adding huge amounts of depth uh, has value. So, so maybe, maybe this was, this was close, but that, that was good enough. Um, and, uh, uh, he trained it for a summer with 30,000 games of self-play, and it became one of the best two or three players in the world. Uh, he later improved it by using a little more search um, uh, on top of that value function at the leaves. But uh, what, what is self-play? So this is really the key thing. that uh, and This self-play is also the basis for Alpha Zero and, and Alpha Go. So, uh, so this is a good concept to know. So just as it sounds, um, this is a two-player game, so you, you, know, you have to say, how do we deal with that adversarial aspect? So what they'll do is they'll have a TD Gammon versus TD Gammon. Um, and the reward function here was a plus one for a win, minus one for a loss. And you're going to have two neural networks. So one of them is going to be held fixed um, for periods of time, and the other one's going to be learning to try to beat that network. So, 
So we're going to initialize two networks, uh, neural net one and neural net two. Um, and then we're going to play K games of neural net one versus neural net two. Um, and they're going to alternate, you know, player one versus player two, so that you learn to play both sides. And what we're going to do is we're going to have N1, neural net one learn. So it's going to use reinforcement learning to update its value function, uh, while N2 is held fixed. So you have a fixed opponent and then one that's learning to beat it. And then we're going to copy whatever was learned to N2 again, right? So, so this N2 is presumably better than what we had before. And now we're going to hold it fixed, and now we're going to continue learning. Um, so you can think of it as you learn a policy, then you learn another policy that tries to beat it, then you learn another policy that tries to beat it, and it keeps on going. Um, so that's what they did. Uh, this is not really a theoretically sound thing to do. Um, oh, can anybody think of reason, ways that this might just break down somehow, this self-play concept? Like, or, or is it guaranteed to always find the best policy uh, uh, in, in some sense? Could it potentially run into an infinite loop where it generates a neural network uh, that beats the first one, that becomes a new one, then there is some strategy or some state that is better able to beat that specific one's play, mm -hmm. but itself has a, another one that uh, can beat that and goes in a rock yeah. paper scissors? Yeah, so, so this could happen. So, I mean, let's say you, it, it finds some, you start off with some strategy, it learns a strategy, and, and that, but it has like a major flaw in it. And so this network learns to beat this one with sort of a stupid, you know, by exploiting that flaw. It's not really a good, robust policy. And then uh, this one will learn to exploit whatever stupid flaw this one has. And then this one will learn to exploit this one. So, so you can end up, end up with these stupid policies that beat each other soundly and you just alternate between them. Uh, for some reason, that doesn't seem to happen here and, and in a lot of cases of self-play, um, possibly because of the randomness. Um, it, it's not really clear why. Um, maybe if, uh, you know, maybe it's a matter of they, they don't train all, all the way to overfit, but, uh, but it wasn't a problem here. It wasn't a problem for alpha zero. This is a pretty common thing to do, but, but you should just be aware that it's not a theoretically sound thing to do. Um, Theoretically, what you'd like is an approach that will converge to something like a uh, minimax strategy or a, you know a Nash equilibrium strategy, but uh, but that's yeah that's a lot more complicated. So this is a nice practical thing, and when you can set something up as self-play, it's it's a good thing to try because uh, the the really nice thing is that you always get some feedback, right? You're always either going to win or lose, and, and you'll get some feedback. Um, and it also has sort of a, a self sort of bootstrapping uh, mechanism if things are working out right because you get better and better, you know, by, little by little. And, uh, you know, it's just bootstrapping from, it's not like you have to climb a mountain before you see any progress whatsoever. Um, so, yeah, so any, any questions about self-play? Yes. Uh, I had a question about rewards. Are there any shaping rewards as well? Because it seems like you will have to wait till the end of the entire game to get a reward. Yeah, not here. There's no shaping rewards. So, so they uh, just relied on playing lots and lots of games. And every time you get a plus one and minus one, and just over many games, you're hoping that you're going to be able to solve that credit assignment problem. Yeah, so, so no shaping rewards, um, just win-loss. And that's also uh, what Alpha Zero does. Uh, so and it seems pretty, seems pretty remarkable, right? Because... There's a lot of stuff that goes on uh, before that plus one or minus one, but uh, but especially early on in, in early on in learning, um, there'll often just be some really bad things to do in bad states that will consistently give you you know losses, for example, and, and those patterns you can probably pick up fairly easily, and then it's just refining those, um, you know. But, you know, this was 300,000 games, which that was a lot of games then. Now, now it's not many games. You know, Alpha Zero is doing a whole lot more. Um, they'd probably be able to train this nowadays in 30 seconds, uh, for, for all I know. Um, and they, they train the chess engine. They, they train their chess program with Alpha Zero in a couple of hours, uh, real-time hours, so they, with, with lots of computers. 
which basically solves chess. So they could probably do this a lot, lot faster. Um, all right. So any other questions on this? Yeah, just for context, when you say in a couple hours, are you saying on the same hardware or on Alpha Zero's incredibly advanced Oh, so a couple of clock uh, wall time hours, uh, and then, okay. yeah, who knows, like thousands of years of CPU hours. Of, not, not a thousand years, but years of CPU time, yeah. All right. Um, so... Uh, so another uh, another application of value-based reinforcement learning, and this this was also a, this was a pretty impressive demonstration at the time. Now now we're kind of used to seeing uh, RL agents playing Atari games, but uh, but at the time it was actually pretty uh, remarkable. Um, so so this uh, so some uh, research group, uh, uh, Michael Bowling's research group, put out this uh, ALE Atari simulator. Um, as a challenge problem for the reinforcement learning uh, community. And uh, who, oh, did anybody ever have a, an Atari 2600? That's probably way older than, than any of you. Uh, you had one? Yeah. Just for like nostalgic cases or like. Yeah. Yeah. I, I used to have one too, like, yeah, way, way back. But, uh, and I, I had mine late. Uh, we got everything, a de you know, a generation late. But, uh, but, uh, but they were these, you know, it was a pretty simple system and, and the games, you know, by today's standards look pretty uh, simple um, and, and they're, most of them are not actually very fun. So, some of them are fun, but some are just horrible. Um, but, but people uh, enjoyed those then. Uh, so, so now, uh, and these, this is just a few games, um, you know, you got Pitfall, you got Berserk and Frogger. I don't know what this was and some shooting game, but there's lots of games and there's an emulator for, for Atari uh, 2600. It's a pretty simple piece of hardware and you can emulate the game playing any, uh, emulate the system playing any game. And the ALE, the uh, Atari learning environment, I guess, arcade learning environment um, uh, gave an interface for a reinforcement learning agent to basically hook up and play any game. And so, uh, so th this, this uh, ALE, the, the arcade learning environment, was actually put out before the deep learning era took off. And, and at that time, you know, the, the challenge was, can you make something that can learn to play any of these games, right, uh, without special engineering for each individual game? Because what you would have to do before is you'd say, okay, I'm going to make an RL agent that learns to play Pitfall. And people did this, um, and, but but they would have to do image processing and specialized featuring feature encoding for Pitfall, right? There, there was no sort of generic method for just taking any game and, and automatically creating the right features. Um, and people were trying to do that a little bit by defining generic notions of. Uh, you know, computer vision operators that extract objects in a generic way and very complicated systems for, for trying to process the input imagery in, in a general way that will work for many games. But it never really uh, worked very well. And then, uh, then DeepMind decided to, uh, so, so about that time, a little a couple of years later, um, computer vision started using deep nets with a lot of success. So they were able to recognize uh, objects, you know, with a, with a lot better than they used to be able to. Uh, and they said, hey, Atari is ultimately a visual domain and actually a very simple visual domain, right? Because if you look at these, you know, there's not a lot of complex background in most of these games. You know, most of it's like constant. And so, so the relevant objects are usually fairly easy to sort of... Uh, identify. Um, uh, and so, so it's not that hard of a visual domain, it seems. And so uh, they tried to uh, hook up a deep net to uh, do reinforcement learning and, you know, it, to, and, and to see if they could get it to work for any game arbitrarily, uh, an arbitrary game. And, this, and what we mean by any game is that you can show it a game without doing any sort of engineering and have it learn to play that game. So you're not going to get something that learns to play, you know, Pitfall, and then all, you know, at the same time, immediately learns to play this game. So it would be different 
You'd start with the same network architecture, but the parameters would be different in each case. So this is the workshop paper that sort of set that off. And then they had a nature paper um, about this at some point. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what they did and the DQN algorithm behind it. And DQN's been you know, superseded by, by other things nowadays, but, uh, but it's still a pretty good basis for, for starting, you know, building an algorithm. So let's see. So uh, the neural network, um, what, what's the output nodes of the neural net? So, so uh, we're going to learn Q functions. And this is an Atari joystick here. So it just had one button and a stick that could move in you know, up, down, left, right, and, and any of the uh, other four intermediate positions. So, so you had eight positions for the joystick, plus it might not be moved at all, so nine positions for the joystick. And then uh, you could have the button either pressed or not pressed when you're moving the joystick. So that's like 18 different combinations of things you could do. And so what they did is they had uh, 18 of these uh, nodes at the output of the neural net. And so this is a node, and it's going to output the Q value for this action, right? That's, uh, that's what each of these is going to be. So you, you basically have a separate uh, node for each action. And then, uh, you know, what, what should we uh, use for the input uh, to this network? Well, they use a uh, uh, they use basically a, f a sequence of recent frames, so so the usually the past four frames um, of the game. Um, now, what what as, as direct input to the network? Now, why do you suppose they use previous frames as opposed to also just only giving the current frame? There is certain information that you can only determine based off of the change between frames, for instance where an enemy is moving. If you can see the previous frames, you know that the enemy was, you know, here and then now it's more to the right. You right. can tell that's moving rightward. Right. Yeah, I mean so that's a good example. So in this game here, for example, there's a there are these bullets. And to, to know what direction the bullet's moving, you can't just look at a frame. You have to look at the previous frame, uh, depending on how fast it is, or maybe even more than the previous frame. So, uh, so there are basic things about the state that are not present in the current visual frame. And that, that's, this is technically a partially observable MDP, but what you're trying to do by giving previous frames is make it so it's essentially fully observable in a sense, the, the state. And it's, it's never really fully observable. Um, there are versions of the ALE. You can set it up so that you actually use the uh, RAM of the, the machine as the state. And then, then you're sort of in the perfect information case. So, but usually that's considered to be cheating, although yeah, it's not, not clear that that's a lot easier. But, uh, but people really like to go from the raw pixel input. Okay, so you've got these four frames, and, and these are usually they'll – I'm not going to go through all the details. Usually they'll convert them to grayscale and do a little bit of cropping. But that, that's, a, that's the extent of the image processing they do. Um, these are usually pretty low resolution. So they're going to feed those into this network, and we're not going to go into the details of it, but it's a, a stra straightforward convolutional neural network. Um, uh, follow, I forget, here it shows two layers that might, might be of what, what they use. Then they have a couple of layers of uh, fully connected uh, units, which sort of do logical combinations of features. And then uh, finally, what you want to do is think of the – you know, Q value nodes here as these nodes are just linear combinations of the features at that final layer, right? So the network processes all of this visual information and then you get features at the final layer and then each of these is a linear combination. And so the Q values are actually sharing features with each other and sometimes that people claim that that's helpful because maybe there's common structure you know, among the Q values. Sometimes it's not helpful because different actions are just very, very different. But, but the standard architecture they use does the sharing. And so they, they fix this architecture once and for all. Like this, this will work for all Atari games, right? Because all Atari games have this visual input. All Atari games have these outputs. 
So now you can feed any Atari game to this architecture, and you can ask it, you know, now we have auto differentiation, you can just do the, the loops that we talked about. But uh, they don't do the basic key learning loop that we showed a couple of slides ago, the one that, you know, the basic loop that I used for the, uh, the tactical battle problem. Uh, instead, they do some uh, key learning with a few uh, enhancements. And, and these enhancements are actually pretty important. Uh, you know, you, it's, it's always hard to judge how important each one is because it's always a little different for each game. But, uh, but these are good things to know about because um, most implementations will use them. So, so uh, I'm, I'm going to summarize here, uh, and then, then we'll go through each, each of them in series, what, they, what they're like. But the first thing is going to be uh, to introduce experience replay. And again, you don't have to read the details here. But experience replay just gives you a way to reuse experience, um, which you know, what, everything we've shown so far, you generate an example, you do an update, then you throw it away, right, rather than remembering it. And that can be wasteful if it requires, you know, non-trivial CPU time to generate these examples. And so that's, uh, so experience replay can be useful. Um, and it's useful for some other reasons that we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, they use this concept of mini batches. So this is, yeah, so instead of just updating based on one little example, each parameter update, they're going to update based on a batch. So we'll see what that means. Uh, another thing that they do is they use the notion of a target network um, when they're defining the targets. And, and so uh, we'll, we'll see why and how. The other thing they do that I think people just forget is that you know, any, any uh, Atari experiment that you see, they're not actually using the true game reward signal like the true game reward is just you know the uh, the the actual score in the game but uh, what they do is they quantize these um, to one zero or negative one based on the sign of the uh, of the reward signal um, and, and this I mean you could say that this is kind of a hack that that was has some good r rationale behind it um, one rationale is that different games will have very different scales of reward. Like one game could be the rewards could go into the thousands or millions. And in another game, maybe the rewards are just like one to 10 or something. Uh, or, you know, at most you'll get one. So uh, like Pong, you know, at most you get 21 points at the end. Uh, versus something like Pac-Man, you could go into the hundreds of thousands. So so when, when that's the problem, when that's the case, it can be hard to... Uh, set up a single system with with a single set of hyperparameters that will work well for, for all these problems with different scales of reward. Because uh, if you think of what happens if you take a game or, or a problem and you scale the reward by a factor of a thousand, it's almost like you're increasing the learning rate by a factor of a thousand. Uh, and, and you can imagine that if you had tuned a system to work in with rewards zero to one and now it's seeing rewards zero to a thousand, it's going to have some trouble um, and, and it will. So, so one reason to do this is just so they can have a nice uniform way of setting hyperparameters that will tend to work well across, across the, uh, the different games. Um, another reason might be this, this is something sometimes one of the hacks you do in, re in deep learning is uh, clipping. So if the gradients are getting too big, you'll just clip them. Uh, even if the loss function is too big, you might clip it. And, and that just helps from uh, these outliers, large values to not sort of send your parameters off into, you know, no man's land. So this is a form of clipping. But we have to remember this, this can fundamentally change uh, the, the optimal policy, right? We're, we're saying, okay, the real goal is to optimize the score. And now we're sort of transforming the score to just like the sign change at each step. And so that, so it could change the optimal policy I don't know if there's been much analysis of the policies in Atari to know how much this was responsible for, you know, bad policies or even just different policies. But uh, yeah, that, it could be interesting to see that. But yeah, it's, it's interesting that nobody really uses the real reward function. So that's something to pay attention to. Um, yeah. So. So let's, let's look at some of these uh, things. So what's experience replay and how do they do it? So as I said, uh, experience replay, 
In a traditional form, uh, one way of thinking about it is you would generate a trajectory and then uh, like a real trajectory and you would store it in memory and then in between real trajectory updates, you would just replay the old trajectories and do Q learning or whatever on those old experiences. So you'd have some proportion of new experiences coming in that you're training on along with sort of imagined experiences from the uh, well, from previous experience. So that's the traditional form. Uh, they do it a little bit differently in, in DQN. So DQN is the this uh, first Atari playing agent. Uh, DQ Q network is what it stands for. So they're going to have a data set. And this, this initial data set might just be play random games. You just take random actions and you put the data in there. And, and the data is just state, action, reward, next state. Tuples. Then uh, we're, we're going to initialize the values, take an explore exploit action. And now we're going to add this observed transition into the data set. Okay? So this is we're, we're storing our experience, and usually there's a limit on the size, and you'll use sort of a recency heuristic to get rid of old data. Um, and you know, people will write papers about you know the best best examples to remove from your data set, but those are all pretty fine details. Um, and then what you're going to do, instead of updating based on the most recent experience, you're going to draw a random tuple from that data set and update based on it. Okay. So that's, see, that's a little different than what we've talked about. Right? Previously, we always just took the experience and updated directly based on it um, as they came in. And you update the uh, queue learning, and then you go to three. Okay, So, so you're Taking an action based on explore exploit, you're adding the transition to the data set, you're drawing something from the data set and doing an update. And Q-learning is good for this because it can be off policy, right? This this has to be done off. This this is an off policy algorithm because we're updating based on just a randomly drawn example each time. So there's different arguments about why, why this approach of just randomly sampling from the data set versus updating based on the recent example is good. Um, nothing really theoretically motivated, uh, but, but generally what they say, you know, the argument is that you want to break the correlation in these updates. So, so if you update just based on the sequence of examples that come in, these are highly correlated with each other. And often regression, which we're doing essentially regression here, so trying to estimate you know, a, a real valued function, they can suffer when certain types of correlation are present in the updates. And, and this kind of breaks the correlation. So that's what they'll say. Uh, and, and I think there's some good intuition there. It's not clear that there's been experiments that really try to evaluate that, um, that mechanism at least. Um, so adding mini batches to that is pretty straightforward. So so we're going to do the same thing. We're going to add every experience to our data set. Then we're going to sample B transitions from D instead of just one. Okay, so this is, this is sort of the just a generalization of what we just did. And then you're going to per perform a Q learning update for each parameter based on the mini batch. What that means is that you're going to compute the gradient based on the mean squared error of the batch of data rather than just that single singleton. And so this gives you kind of an averaging effect. And uh, you, know, you could do a gradient update on the whole data set. You know, that, that would be the, the really most extreme case. But, uh, but many batches tend to be sort of the, a, a good go-between between, between doing individual updates and you know, updating based on the whole data set. And then you go to three, right? And so this is almost what DQN is. Um, uh, it, DQN uses many batches and experience replay. Uh, and it's a randomized type of mini batch, um, but they they add one more thing: this target network. And this this I think is actually pretty important. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't know if we've done detailed analysis of you know how how important it is for for Atari, but uh, but it makes some sense. So uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to have something. We're going to have our two networks. We're going to we're going to going to call them the update network. So you got some parameters there, and then theta prime is going to be our target network. Um, and we're going to use the target network 
uh, it's kind of like, it's not exactly analogous to self-play, but it's similar. So in self-play, we had this network that we held fixed and we were learning against it, right? And we, we kinda, that kind of made a lot of sense there because it was an adversarial game and you're holding something fixed and you're trying to beat it. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to hold the target network fixed. And you remember Q-learning has to uh, estimate target values for each of its updates. We're going to use that fixed thing to compute the target values, and periodically we're going to we're going to update it to the the latest learned thing. Uh, so we're going to hold this target network fixed for a while. So let's see what that looks like. So the main change is so we randomly sample the transitions. You're going to perform a Q learning update, um, and I, I should say to these parameters. I'm going to add that in. Um, based on a mini batch. And in fact, I'm going to add that in now so I don't forget. So perform a key learning update on theta. There we go. Like that. On theta based on the mini batch. And the, uh, the key thing is the target is computed based on theta prime. Okay. So, so you're updating these parameters based on sort of a constant held fixed target. And every K updates, where K is a parameter we could pick, you're just going to refresh the target network to the latest and greatest thing. So it's very analogous to self-play and uh, kind of similar intuitions about why it might be useful. Um, what, what sometimes happens uh, is you, know, you, you update... If you were using theta here to update, uh, to compute targets for theta, like a bad, like a, an aggressive update to theta can cause it to sort of uh, uh, get a bad target value the next time, and then uh, you will sort of uh, get a bad, a worse theta because of that. So you can end up getting these explosions where the update to theta causes theta to sort of overestimate values. And then you get overestimated targets, and you get overestimated values, and it's almost exactly what happened in that counterexample for Q-learning that I showed you. Um, this tends to stabilize things a little bit more because uh, you're you're holding something fixed. It's almost like uh, in policy iteration, you hold the current policy fixed while you uh, figure out how to improve it for a little bit. That's how you want to sort of think about this. All right, so. I don't know, this, now this is basically a DQN. This is the algorithm. Um, so are there any questions about, about this? All right, so just a few, few things that they added, target networks and mini batches, and, and, uh, and there's intuition for each of these. Um, and so these words sort of give you the intuitions for each of those. All right. And they're showing you a few examples here. Um, I don't know what, what these are, what, what these were anymore. But you, you can see that generally you do a lot better than random. And I guess we're out of time. So so uh, next time we're, we're basically done with this. And I'll show you a Atari policy. But then we're going to move on to a policy gradient uh, after this.